this computer. There we go. Okay. This might be my favorite topic. Gases. <laughs> <clears throat> it can be involved, but it doesn't have to be. The, uh, in fact, modern chemistry started with gases. Maybe that's why it's my favorite. <clears throat> Shut out the riffraff. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna cover gases. Then uh, we have two more exams after that: acids and bases, redox oxidation, uh, redox reactions. We're not gonna do it. This one's got um, energy in it. We're not gonna do that because there's not enough time. <coughs> Besides, it's not required in the uh, course description. <clears throat> not Chem 100, anyway. Let's see. Does everybody have the um, have the documents you need? I think you. Have to grab mine. Okay, that's why I have an extra. <laughs> All right. So that's your outline. We're going to get to those eventually. So <clears throat> I started talking about gases as the starting place for modern chemistry. And that's true. But we need to have a reason for studying gases. And, uh, well, one is really simple gases are everywhere. We need to, need to understand gases as far as chemistry goes to know why you need to breathe, for instance. The nature of air <clears throat> is one thing. Real phenomena, uh, actually, the study of gases was the easiest place to start. I mean, chem chemists, some chemists are gluttons for punishment, but most of us aren't. You know, we want to take the, the simplest route. And gases are very simple. In fact, gases behave under these conditions, behave as if the molecules aren't even there. Because they're so far apart in the gas, they don't interact. Right? So uh, one gas behaves just like the other one in a physical sense before you get to the, the reactions. And uh, um, we can also gain a working knowledge of science itself by studying gases. Hopefully that'll become obvious as we proceed. And I said this before, the beginning, the fundamental breakthroughs in chemistry occurred with the study of gases. All right, so what's a gas? This is probably a reminder for most of you. Um, a gas has certain physical properties that characterize it from other states of matter. One is that if you put it in a container, it will fill the container. There'll be no spaces left. It expands to fill the container. <clears throat> and it takes the shape of the container too. So a gas has no shape of its own. It has no volume of its own always has to be contained some form or fashion. Now, when chemists study gases or physicists study gases, we have real containers, jars and, and things that hold the gas in. But in the universe, other things hold gases in. For the Earth, it's gravity. That's what keeps gases on the surface of the Earth. And of course, the higher you go, the less dense it gets. Eventually, you reach a point where um, 
there's not enough to breathe. Curse it. Something over 10,000 feet. If you're over 10,000 feet, you better have a, a mask and breathable air. <clears throat> but that's beside the point. Um, a gas will exert pressure on its surroundings. So when you confine a gas in a, in a container, you can, uh, through a port, uh, stick a gauge and measure a pressure. That is, the gas is, is pushing on the out the container. Right. Of course, with most gauges, um, their reference point is the atmosphere. So if you have a, a gas that goes into your container at atmospheric pressure and you seal it off, you're not going to measure a pressure because it's going to be measured against the outside and they're equal. So you're going to measure zero pressure. But if you, if you take a gauge and measure the pressure in your tire, it has been purposely overinflated so that the tire will be semi-rigid. And you can measure a pressure difference from the inside to the outside of the tire. We're gonna talk about that. That's, yeah, that's Charles Law. <laughs> the, the variation of uh, volume and consequently pressure for a gas depends on temperature. <clears throat> okay, so how do we measure pressure? Well, pressure is an intensity factor. In other words, you could measure pressure if you had uh, 10 valves in your tire, those little nipple valves, if you had them lo located around your tire and both, all of them had access to the in interior of the tire, you'd measure pressure here all the way around, be exactly the same everywhere you measure. That's an intensity factor. It doesn't change with the place you measure and how much there is. And it's measured actually as a force per unit area. That's pressure. So we have a, a force per unit area. <coughs> and uh, well, theoretically, you can pick anything you want, whatever the force is, like uh, pounds. Right? We could say a force of so many pounds applied on an area of a square inch. Okay, otherwise known as PSI. Okay, so take a tire gauge, check the pressure on your tire, it's going to read out in PSI, pounds per square inch. <clears throat> but that's not the metric system. Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, we use different values for pressure uh, in the sciences. They are interconvertible, like any measure. All you need is a conversion factor, and you can change one into another. Um, the international metric system uh, uses a force as a measure of newtons per square meter because meter is the standard of length so the standard for area would be a square meter right and the standard for force is the newton so newtons per square meter um, and we've also given this a special value in honor of uh, a scientist who studied gases and, and other things. His name was Pascal. So that is one uh, PA, Pascal. Okay. Now this Newton is a derived value of force. And it's derived from this formula. If you've had physics, you know what that means. That's Newton's second law of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration. So this force is derived from the standard mass, right? That's the fundamental unit of mass. And acceleration, which is itself a derived unit of meters per uh, meters per second per second. 
Okay. So put these together and your units are kilogram meters per second squared. That's equal to a newton. So the only reason I'm showing you all of this stuff is just that all of these things are interconvertible. Right? They're related to one another. We didn't just pull these things out of thin air. Okay. But for simplicity's sake, and historically, um, for this class, we're going to use a measure of pressure as one atmosphere is our standard. And that's the amount of pressure that the air exerts on average on any object at sea level, one atmosphere. And the temperature has to be 25 degrees. No, gas, excuse me. Gas is at zero degrees. That's standard temperature. This is standard pressure. So whenever you see STP, it doesn't mean a gas additive. It means standard temperature and pressure. Zero degrees in one atmosphere. And this holds only for gases. Zero degrees is for gases only. <coughs> standard temperature for everything else is 25 degrees Celsius. But for this chapter, you can settle on zero degrees centigrade. Okay. So, um, we settle on one atmosphere as our standard of pressure for historical reasons. How would you measure the pressure? Right? That was a question that uh, Torricelli answered in the 17th century, he developed what we call now the barometer. And it measures air pressure. Right? And it does so by opposing forces of a vacuum versus air pressure. So how does he, how did he do that? Okay. This is a representation of Torricelli's barometer. He just had a, um, a jar or tub of mercury. It's gonna go like this. So there's your mercury. Mercury's a liquid at room temperature, right? Couldn't do it with a solid because the solid won't, won't move, all right? Couldn't do it with another, we could have done it with another gas, but the problem with gases is can't see them, most of them. And the ones you can see are usually toxic. So he had to go with a liquid. And the logical liquid to use is mercury. For one reason, it's very dense. So you don't have to have a tube that's you know, uh, 30 feet long. He could have used water, right? Water's a liquid, put it in his tube. But if he had done that, water is less dense than mercury you would have had a 33 foot long tube in order to measure one atmosphere of pressure. So we use mercury because the tube is a lot shorter. And they didn't care too much about toxicity of mercury in those days, probably didn't understand it. So we took a tube, I'm gonna draw it here first, uh, in place. So there's a tube, it's closed at one end, in the 17th century, they knew how to make tubes of uniform diameter. Right? No problem. So he had a glass blower making one and sealed it off at one end. And he filled it up with mercury right? all the way to the top. He put his thumb over it and inverted it and submerged his hand in the mercury. Right? And then took his thumb off. And held it there with some supporting structure. But what happened? The mercury that was up here is now down here. It dropped. <clears throat> and he reasoned that it dropped to a point where 
the, the weight of the mercury here is exactly balanced by the atmospheric pressure on this mercury around it because the pressure is transmitted through that mercury up into the tube. Okay, and he was correct. <clears throat> so at sea level, this uh, one atmosphere is equal to, from the level of the mercury here to the level there, was 760 millimeters. Okay, so that's why one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And sometimes we also honor Torricelli by saying, rather than millimeters of mercury, we'll say 760 Tor. Same thing. It's just with Tor, it's understood that that's in terms of millimeters of mercury. So they only have to say one word instead of two. Yes, they're equivalent. These two. Are we going to go over like why like atmospheric pressure like that to try and lay a word? No, that's physiology. Yeah. It's the quick For what? How it affects bones? Like you know, like Fort Wayne or something like that. I'm gonna lay it up there and try to Oh. Um, okay, the simple explanation is that your bodies are constantly under pressure from the outside <clears throat> and the internal pressure balances that exactly. Okay. So if the outside pressure changes, say it decreases, then the inside pressure is going to push out some until it balances. And that change, that fluctuation is what you feel in your joints. People with arthritis are particularly sensitive to those changes. Right, you've got you've got nerve endings in here, and if there's inflammation, then it, the nerves don't like it. Okay, so that was a uh, barometer, and this measured air pressure. And Torricelli took it, threw it in his ox cart, went up a mountain, and he noticed that when he went up the mountain, the level of mercury dropped. So he reasoned that the higher you go, the lower the air pressure pushing down on that uh, vat of mercury. And he was right. And then he went below sea level. I don't know where he would do that, maybe down in a mine. Or, or somebody did it. Maybe he didn't do it. And they noticed that the pressure went up. Okay. So they used that to measure air pressure. And uh, once he created this thing, uh, I mean, it was the rage. All, everybody wanted one, scientists or no. And they used them. Uh, some people used them and observed how it changed just sitting right there on your desk over time. And they eventually uh, drew a correlation between uh, good weather, bad weather, and changes in barometric pressure. And they noticed when the pressure was dropping, they're expecting bad weather's on the way. If it goes up, good weather's coming. And that still holds today. We know today that it <clears throat> has to do with low pressure systems and high pressure systems in the atmosphere. Right, so you should see pressure drop over the past day or two should have dropped considerably with the approach of bad weather. Okay, so a modification of this uh, design um, was used to measure the pressure of gases in confined space, right? So you just take the, um, you take this and close it off right here, and you open it up at one point and connect that to your confined gas. Then the pressure of the gas is being exerted on the surface of the mercury. And you can measure the pressure of the gas inside your container. That's called a manometer. Okay. And all you have to do is measure the difference between the surface here and the surface there. That is your pressure. Usually, 
this amount is, is pretty large. So any change up here has very little effect on the height of that. So once you, once you adjust this too, so that um, you're measuring uh, once it's set, then usually the change here is so minuscule that you don't have to, you can say, you can have a gauge point there, right? And it's fairly constant. And this is the only one that moves. Okay. Other things, uh, other uses, the sphygmomanometer, you know that, what that is? Otherwise known as the blood pressure cuff. Right. So you just wrap your arm in that thing and pump it up with pressure and the pulsing of your heart in your uh, arteries will make them expand and contract with each pulse. And that pushes against uh, the mercury that's in the tube, in the cuff, well, now it's air, but uh, it's registered on a meter. But it used to be, some doctor's offices still had these things hanging on their walls, right? Yeah, some of them have dials now, but the older ones had a, a mercury column and they would measure your blood pressure in millimeters of mercury. So when your, your blood pressure is 120 over 80, <coughs> that's 120 uh, millimeters of mercury versus 80 millimeters of mercury, uh, systolic versus diastolic. Okay, so it's all related. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we know? Well, of course the barometer quantifies air pressure, but this is a demonstration that, that proves that the pressure has, uh, is applying force on every object. All you have to do is fill this can up with an empty paint can or a, a paint thinner can with a little water, heat it up, and it will boil and expel all the air out of that can. So nothing in there but water vapor, right? Then you put your gloves on, of course. Cap it before it has a chance to cool Take it off the heat and let it cool down or turn off your burner. And as that water contracts, what does it leave behind? Empty space, a vacuum. And the difference in pressure is like 14.7 pounds per square inch. On every square inch, you got almost 15 pounds. And that's enough to collapse that can. My father used to do that every he used to teach uh, earth science. So when they got to the discussion of the atmosphere, he would do that demonstration for his class. This is eighth graders. <laughs> so they get a real kick out of it. Yeah, he, I remember doing it for like summer grade. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And I remember how like, loud it popped. It, it was really aggressive reaction. Uh-huh. I, I really, really like it louder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he talked back in the days when you didn't have video recorders or video projectors. You had the 16 millimeter film. So he'd set up the, the projector for his class. And uh, if they behaved himself, when they got to the end, he'd run it backwards so they could watch all the motion going backwards. They got a, they got a kick out of that too. <clears throat> okay, so how do we convert pressure? Let's say we measure the pressure of a gas at two and a half atmospheres, and we want to convert that to both Tor and Pascals. So we do it the same way we did every other conversion we've ever done. All right, so if you learn how to do it once, you can repeat it. All you need is your conversion factor. So we have to convert atmospheres to Tor. Right? So what's the relationship? One atmosphere is equal to 764. Right? So it's just this times that. Oh, that cancels. Okay. You're going to show me? There it is. Okay. So 
It's about 1,900 torque. It's 1,900 torque. Now, the conversion to Pascals is a little bit different. You need a different conversion factor. And one atmosphere equals 101,325 Pascals. That value is in your review document, right? In the useful information. So you don't have to remember it. Just if a question comes up, you know where to look. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So let's say the vapor pressure over a beaker of hot water is measured at 656 torr. We can convert that. Go the other direction. Right? We have 760 torr, one atmosphere, and it's going to be something less than one. So that one's out. It's too big. Uh, it's nowhere near half. So it's either one of these right here. So let's see if we can reason. <coughs> Probably 8.86. Yeah. Just estimating the ratio of 60, uh, 66 to 76. I figured it would be 0.8. And on a test, you know, if I forgot the calculator, I'm pretty sure to get that one out. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the progression of chemical investigations, quantitative chemistry, starting with gases. And Robert Boyle was an Englishman who was given credit for. Uh, being one of one of the first um, quantitative scientists, right? They started with with gases, um, uh, primarily because they were easy to work with. In other words, they had the instrumentation in place to investigate gases quantitatively, whereas they didn't have um, everything they needed to investigate other things like liquids and solids and other parameters <clears throat> that were involved. So he used what he had and investigated gases in the, well, shortly after Torricelli came up with his barometer. He also used mercury, but Boyle investigated the relationship of pressure versus volume in a confined gas. Okay. Now there are four parameters that completely describe a gas. Pressure is one, volume is the other, temperature, and how much of it there is. That's my abbreviation for moles. Right? So pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. That will completely describe your gas. So in order to investigate the relationship of pressure and volume, oil had to hold these two constant. You can't let them vary. They have to be held constant so that any changes that occur in one of these is directly related to the other one. If you let these vary, then you don't know which one's responsible for the change. Right? That's, a, that's a, a common maxim in science. It's called control. You've got to hold something fixed so that when something else changes, you know it's not due to this one changing. You hold it fixed. So these have to be um, constant so that these can be allowed to vary. So that's what Boyle did, and he used this J tube. So he knew that if he filled up, if he had a J tube like this, open at this end, closed at that end, it was full of air. 
right? He knew there was a gas in there. So he, he added mercury here. And he added a little bit, and then he added a little more, and eventually it touched the, the inside curve, that J tube. And at that point, this gas was trapped. It's not going anywhere. It's not going out that way. Of course, it's not going out this way. So now he has his gas trapped, and he can keep filling it up. But he noticed the more he put in here, the higher he had to go on this side for this one to move up, right? So the trapped gas was exerting pressure on that mercury and holding this column up a certain height above this level. Okay. So there's your difference. That measures the pressure on this gas in here. The difference in those two levels. So that's the way he, he set up his, his data. His data for pressure was simply um, the height, the difference in height of mercury. And the volume was actually the height of the column. Actually, wait a minute. Uh, the difference in height, yeah. The difference in height here, here, was the pressure. And the actual height here, here, was the volume. Right? From here to here was the volume. And here is the pressure. <coughs> So we noticed that as this one increased, as this difference in height increased, there's more and more and more up here, got a bigger difference. As this increased, what happened to the volume? It decreased. So they're inversely related. And he put that in a formula. He said pressure times volume equals a constant. And all he had to do was to find that constant was to multiply this value times that value equals this value. There's K1, K2, K3. For each of the measurements, he got these K values and he noticed that they were all the same value within experimental error. So if this one times that one was say 100, then the next time you measured it, that one would be 102. <clears throat> so that is Boyle's law. Pressure times volume is equal to a constant. Anytime you have um, a variable times another variable, that is um, product, <coughs> the product of two variables means inverse relationship. Mathematically, you can reason it out. If this is constant, it can't change. So if that one goes up, this one has to go down, vice versa. Okay. All right, that's Boyle's law. And uh, He knew, well, I just assumed here that the height of that column was proportional to the volume, that means volume. The reason he can do that is because, like I said before, glass blowers are really good at producing uniform diameter tubes. And as long as the, the diameter of that tube is constant, then height's the only thing that changes. And you know that the volume, the trapped volume in there, is equal to that height um, or the length here, I'm saying height, uh, times the diameter, times the area. Height times area is volume right, of, a, of a cylinder. Right? So this area is equal to what? Well, if we're talking about diameter, then it's uh, uh, pi d squared over four. 
pi r squared, but r squared is also equal to d squared over four. <clears throat> so that's why he could, he could interpret this data as the volume is related to height. He didn't have to actually calculate the volume. Okay, so that's Robert Boyle and his law, and this is demonstration. <coughs> Multiply each one of these, and you get values that are reasonably close. Right. So those would be equivalent to the K's, constants. Okay, what does the graph look like? Well, if you get uh, pressure versus volume, well, actually, it could be either way around. We're going to be consistent, right? The independent variables on the x-axis. So that's the pressure. And the dependent variable is the volume. But when you graph the data, you still get a curve like that. So as pressure increases, volume decreases. Or as pressure decreases this way, volume increases. Right? And this relationship always produces a hyperbola. Remember what a hyperbola is? In this case, it's a curve. And no matter how far you go up here or out here, never touches the axis. Right? It approaches. It's the word, the fancy word is asymptotic. It approaches touching, but it never touches. That's a hyperbola. Hyperbola is also one of the conic sections. I don't know if it's been explained that way before. When you take a cone and cut it certain ways, you get these different figures, right? So there's your cone. If you cut it this way, what do you get? Looking down, you get a circle, right? Perfect circle. Cut it this way, what do you get? Get an ellipse. Okay. If you cut it this way, you get a parabola. And if you cut it, like you cut it uh, off axis anyway, you get a hyperbola. Those are conic sections. That's a, you don't have to know that. It's just, you know, if somebody mentions it at a party, then you can wow your friends. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the way it looks. If you just plot the raw data, you get a curve. And like I've said before, scientists hate curves. If we can make a straight line out of something, we'll do it. So how would we make a straight line out of this? Well, let's see, let's modify this equation. Right, using algebraic manipulation so that we still have our equality, but we just move things around. So let's divide both sides by volume. How about that? That's valid. If we divide both sides by volume, that one cancels. We have pressure equals to K times one over V. Right? So now if we plot pressure against one over volume, it has a slope of K, right? Because Y equals MX plus V. There's your X, there's your Y, there's your slope. So if we plot pressure against one divided by V, then we get a slope of a straight line. Okay, and that's what we do. That's that's what my uh, Gen Chem one class does in their Boyle's law exercise. That's where they're supposed to do it. <laughs> they get graded for it. In other words. Okay. 
Now, um, this is this is Boyle's law, that right there. But we find it more convenient sometimes to um, make another transformation in Boyle's law for simplicity's sake and to make it more useful. So when we do this, if we have, uh, if we measure pressure, if we measure pressure at a certain point and the volume associated with it, right? That's equal to a constant, isn't it? We don't change anything. Don't change the temperature, don't change the number of moles. Everything's the same. Only we allow the pressure to change versus the volume and we measure it again. Then we have a second pressure times the volume, right? What's it equal to? It's equal to K, right? They're both equal to K. So what's that mathematical principle of commutative property? If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So those two are equal to one another. So the first one, is equal to the second one. That's useful. I mean, if we measure pressure and volume under one condition, we allow the pressure to change, then we can calculate the volume, the new volume. Right? So this is what I call before and after math. And each of the gas models we're going to discuss has associated with it a before and after. This is Boyle's laws before and after. I'm gonna put it up here so we're keeping, I'm gonna keep this information available. I can erase the rest of it. <clears throat> okay, I don't wanna run out of time, so I'm gonna skip that for now. Uh, it just, it just says that if you have uh, before conditions and only part of your after conditions, you can find out what the other one is, right? It's like any algebraic expression. If you have one unknown, you can solve it. And in this case, the new volume, when we go from uh, 0.9 atmospheres to 1.2 atmospheres, we increase the pressure, so we would expect the volume to decrease, and it does. It goes from 12.4 to 9.8. Now the, the standards for these that we're gonna be using are atmospheres for pressure, volume will be in liters. Um, we'll talk about temperatures, N is, is in moles. And temperature has to be in Kelvin. So I'll explain that a little more when we get to it. Okay. So what we notice is that, um, wait a minute, did I skip one? Okay, now we're gonna to go to Charles Law. <clears throat> Charles was a Frenchman and his investigations were uh, related to volume versus temperature. He came along later almost a century later. And the reason that we had to wait this amount of time for those investigations was up until Charles' decades, we didn't have a reliable way to measure temperature. So we had to invent the thermometer. Right? Or it had to be invented. Once I got a, a reliable thermometer, then you could do these investigations, volume versus temperature. So if we're gonna let volume and temperature change, what do we have to hold constant? Pressure, pressure and moles, right? So the pressure has to be maintained constant along with the number of moles. One of the easiest ways to do that you have a cylinder with a piston in it and 
some mass on it, like let's just pick one kilogram. So you have one kilogram on there in addition to the atmospheric pressure. Okay. So you have that mass on there and that's always coming. As long as you don't move this like to a higher altitude or a lower altitude, you're good. Now you can change the temperature and watch the effect on volume. Okay. So Charles did that and when he did it, it didn't matter what gas it was, he always got a straight line. Volume versus temperature gave him a straight line. It didn't always give him the same straight line, but it always gave him a straight line. So what does that mean? That means as temperature goes up, volume goes up. Right? That's a direct relationship, not an inverse, but a direct. And the relationship there is volume divided by temperature equals a constant. Right? So quotients equal to a constant implies a direct proportionality. Whereas products always imply an inverse proportion. The quotients imply a direct relationship. Okay. Um, when you when you plot this data. The, um, you would prefer that the intersection of the line go through the origin. Right through here. But when uh, Charles was using uh, his thermometer, it was calibrated in the degree centigrade. And it would come and intersect the line up here somewhere. <laughs> So we needed a different scale, a scale that would give us a zero, zero intersection point where we the origin of the graph. Centigrade didn't do it, degree centigrade. So there was a, I forget his real name, but he, was, he went by Lord Kelvin which means he probably had lots of time and money so he could do this gentleman research. And he says, what would happen if we kept decreasing the temperature and watching the volume? Right. Just theoretically, if we extend these lines out here like that, So at what temperature um, and the degree centigrade might be zero might be here somewhere. Right? At what temperature would the volume be zero? Right? Now this is theoretical because we know that the volume of a gas when you cool it will never get to zero. Right? What will it do? It will turn to a liquid and then to a solid. Right, so it's going to have a definite volume. But theoretically speaking, if you keep decreasing the temperature of your gas until it reaches uh, zero, oh, I got that turned around. Sorry. This is temperature. This is volume. So the volume is going to continue to decrease until you um, reach the origin. And here is uh, zero degrees centigrade, right there. So where did uh, Lord Kelvin find this place to be? Minus 273 degrees centigrade, right? So he said, okay, I need to put my name on something, so I'm gonna devise a temperature scale. I'm gonna call it K. And I'm not even going to put a degree on it. It's just because I'm so egocentric, you know, 
It's just K to kill them. So zero K is the temperature here. <laughs> zero degrees centigrade then will be 273 K. Right? So now we have the ability to uh, plot our data. And if it's on the Kelvin scale, then it will always go through the origin. On the Kelvin scale, that's zero, zero, right there. And in fact, whenever you, whenever you uh, solve equations for gases, the temperature must always be Kelvin. If it's not Kelvin, then the relationship falls apart. Okay. So how do we get, if we have a degree centigrade, how do we get Kelvin? Degree centigrade plus 273 equals K. If you have K, say you have, you solved a problem and you've got your temperature in, in K. But the question on the test asks for, what's the temperature in centigrade, right? So you just plug it in here, solve for that one, which means K minus 273 is degree centigrade. Okay. Um, all right. So we can use the same reasoning where Charles Law at, under one situation allows the temperature to vary and we measure the volume again. And in that case, we have V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. That's before and after for Charles Law. Okay. And in this case, we're given the temperature in centigrade, but we've got to convert it to Kelvin. Right. So that's what this is right here. Uh, this was before, this is after. So before temperature in Kelvin, after temperature in Kelvin, before volume in Kelvin, after volume we solve. Okay, um, let's see. Avogadro is next. Avogadro was an Italian. And his interest was in uh, variations of volume and moles. So this one and this one were allowed to vary. So that means this one had to be constant and that one had to be constant. So we had to hold the temperature constant and you have to hold the pressure constant and change the number of moles and see what effect it had on volume. Well, the short version is they're direct proportional. Increase the number of moles, increase the volume. That really makes sense. You try to shove more gas into something, it's going to expand. That's Avogadro's law. So if we use the before and after method, we get that. Okay, we're already into the 19th century. Now, Avogadro's law is extremely valuable when you talk about chemical reactions, right? Because let's take an example. Say um, uh, nitrogen plus hydrogen, these are both gases, yields 
ammonia gas. Okay, so let's balance this thing. Uh, we need uh, two of these and six of those and three here. Okay, so if we put nitrogen and hydrogen together in a container and we assume that they react completely. So these are gone and this is all that's left. How many moles do you start with? Well, stoichiometrically speaking, you have one here plus three here, right? So you have four moles of gas to start with. So if we put four moles here, and you end up with only two moles, right? So the moles of gas has decreased during this reaction. So what should the volume do? It should decrease also, right? Because they're directly related. Right, so if we go from four to two, then this one would go to, well, pick a number. Let's say we start off at, um, uh, say, two liters. This one would have to go to one liter in order to maintain the constant. Two divided by four is the same as one divided by two. Okay. Clean up our stuff here. All right, that's Avogadro's law. The number of moles change, the volume changes in direct proportion. And there's a problem even worse, but we're gonna, you're gonna have several of these in your review document. And don't forget to go to Blackboard. And it's got the key, and it's got how I work the problem. Right? So if you get stumped, you can look at that. On one of those, like uh, 62. You mean in the, in the gases? Oh, oh, yeah, why did I put E and D? Did the uh, work problems explain it? So calculating it, you get 6.07. Yeah, that's all you got to work it out. Okay, that's a typo. Just B. Yeah, it's just B. I have to make that correction. Okay. So let's get a move on before I run out of time, okay? Uh, boils. Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law. So we got those three laws up there. And we can solve before and after problems as long as we recognize that if we're gonna let these two vary, the other two have to be constant. But before we go to the ideal gas law, I'm going to show you the combined gas law. This is another version of before and after. If you combine these, look where the pressure volume is. Pressure volume is in the numerator. So P1, V1, V2, V2 in the numerator. What's in the denominator? Oops. <clears throat> temperature. Temperature is in the denominator. And moles is in the denominator. That's the combined gas law. Notice that if you if you hold um, 
temperature in moles constant, you get Boyle's law. If you hold pressure in moles constant, you get Charles' law. And if you hold pressure and temperature constant, you get Avogadro's law. Okay. So sometimes, sometimes it's more convenient to work from the combined gas law and just recognize, all right, which one's held constant? And then you use the other two to solve your problem. But they don't have to be. With this law, you can let everything vary. As long as one of them is unknown, you can solve the problem. Say we know the beginning conditions here, 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 and here. Then we let this one change, that one change, and that one change. You can solve for the new volume. Right? It's like any algebraic expression. One unknown, you can solve it. Okay? Now for the ideal gas law. This is before and after, but under some conditions, you only know what state you're in right now. You don't know how you got there, right? So we need a version, we call it the ideal gas law, that will allow us to calculate any one of these variables as long as we know the other three. And that is like that. So, and these both are equal to the same constant, right? Just like we did with these, those are both equal to that constant. So what, what we're gonna do is for the ideal gas law, we're gonna throw the after out and just say the now. This is the now is equal to the constant. In this case, um, if, we, if we take standard values for these, plug them in there, then we can calculate this constant in terms of those units of measure, right? So if pressure is atmospheres, and we say one atmosphere, and temperature is zero degrees centigrade, which is 273K, Plug those values in. The number of moles, one mole. And then we measure the volume under these conditions, we find that it's 22.4 liters. Then if we plug those values in, we can find out what this constant is. And we give it a new value, we call it R. <clears throat> and with those units of measure, We get that value 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K. All right? So now that if we now that we know what that value is, it's a constant, then as long as we use the right units of measure, then if we know three of these, we can solve for the fourth one. And we don't know how, how we had to, had to get there. It doesn't matter how you got there. If you can measure those values except for one. Software. Now, um, so that's PV over TN equals R. We usually write it, um, keep this over here and put these two over there. It's usually written PV equals NRT. And with this one being constant, all you have to know is the other three. But you do have to be careful with your units of measure, right? Because the constant has these units of measure, so the variables have to individually have those units. But that being the case, you can solve uh, for an unknown under what conditions you're at right now. You don't have to know before and after, okay? Um, let me back, back up for a second. Um, when you're solving these equations before and after, the only one that has to be a specific unit of measure is temperature. Temperature has to be K, always. But the others, 
They can be anything you want because it's a ratio. So the volumes, as long as the volumes are the same units of measure, you're good. As long as the amount is the same units of measure, you're good. Uh, you can have milliliters here instead of liters. It doesn't matter. They're going to cancel. So ratios, except for temperature, ratios, um, you can use any, any measure, units of measure that you want. And that can save you some steps uh, because you don't have to change it to these units. And time is critical on tests under that. Okay, so that's the ideal gas law. And this is the, the R value, the constant that we're going to be using. If you look in, in the uh, useful information, that chart, you'll see several R's in there. So R, depending on what equation it's found in, and R is found everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, the ideal gas constant. I was doing the homework, mm -hmm. and that threw me off. Because I, I had been looking at it. Like Which one do you use? It, yeah. Yeah. The, it had the PBRT or the PB increase, but the R was not in there. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, okay. So th that's one of the, when you first read a problem, you have to ask yourself a gas problem. Is this a before, after, or is this a state right now? If it's a state right now, you go to this one. This one. And we're only going to use R of that value. Okay. How do you know which one to use? Say if you've got, um, you go on and take more chemistry, and we end up with an equation that has an R in it, which one do you use? Well, you look at the other units in the equation, and they will tell you which R to use. One of them is, is uh, commonly used as joules per mole K. Right? So if you have an equation that has an energy value in it, it's probably going to be this one, joules per mole K, rather than liter atmospheres per mole K. Okay. But um, in this class, you only have to be concerned with that one. If you want to, you can memorize it. It won't hurt my feelings. Okay, so here's a, a situation where you have an automobile tire with 23 degrees C outside. Uh, the volume inside the tire is 25 liters, and you fill it with air to a pressure of 3.18 atmospheres. How many moles are in that? Well, let's see. You got uh, temperature. We do have volume. We do have pressure. We got our constant, we can solve for moles. Now in this case, I rearrange the equation to put moles on one side, then you fill in the rest of the information. But if you prefer, you can put them in there and then solve for them. Either way, it works fine. We did have to change the temperature to Kelvin though. Okay. Um, what's the pressure in things? This is another ideal gas. So in this one, notice we have the volume in liters. That's good. We have the temperature in, in C. We just change it to Kelvin. But this one is 5.67 kilograms of helium. That has to be changed to moles change it to moles, that's what this is, in. So there's your kilogram to grams, and there's your grams to moles, molar mass. Okay. So you look at your equation, all right, what units do I need? Do I have them? No. I do have the information I need, though, because if I know this, I can find out how many moles there are. Okay. In this one, 
Is this a state, an ideal gas law situation or a before and after? <clears throat> Look at the information you're given. At a temperature, at what temperature does 121 milliliters of CO2 at 27 degrees and 105 atmospheres occupy a volume of 293 milliliters? milliliters at a pressure of 1.4. Okay. What's it asking? It's asking for a temperature, right? So it's asking for a temperature. We can call it uh, temperature two. But this is starting conditions. At what temperature does this become that? before and after, right? So this one is unknown. We're starting at a temperature of 27 degrees centigrade, right? Um, volume one and two, do we have that? 121 milliliters. It's important that you put it in the right place before you stick it in your formula. Um, <clears throat> it's going to a volume of 293. Okay. All right, so I got that backwards. Even I'm making sense. 293 is where we're ending up. And where we're starting is 121. And then what else do we know? Pressure. So what's the pressure before? The pressure before is associated with 121 milliliters. So that's 1.05 atmospheres. <clears throat> and the final pressure is going to be 1.40 atmospheres. Okay? So what do we have here? We've got temperature, volume, and pressure. What about moles? It doesn't say anything about moles. You can assume that moles does not change. This gas is confined, so we're not going to add any more moles to it. So that means if we have uh, P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2, then the moles go out. And now we have PV over T equals P2V2 over T2. Now you can plug in your values and solve for your unknown. So there's your equation. And these are the values that should be, this should be on the P1, the, the one side, and this is on the two side. And then you have to reconvert K back to C. It turns out it's pretty hot. <laughs> okay, one more law. Dalton's law of partial pressures. <clears throat> Remember Dalton, the atomic theory? That wasn't the only thing he did. He liked to play around with gases too. So he said, um, if you have a mixture of gases in a container, the total pressure that you measure in that container is an arithmetic sum of the pressures of each of the individual gases. Like if you had that container and only one of the gases in there, it would give you a pressure. Then if you swap it out for the other gas that's in that container in its amount, however much it is, it will give you a different pressure. And if you put them both together, It'll give you a total pressure that's the sum of the two. Right. So we have the pressure of, of one gas plus the pressure of the second gas plus any other gases, and then just on out to however many gases you have. Total gas. 
So that way, um, you can investigate individual gases even if they're in a mixture. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a practical example. The air, right? The air bearing down on us, well, it's not one atmosphere here because we're at 2,500 feet. But let's just assume it's one atmosphere for argument's sake. That's the total pressure on you at any one time. It's due to the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of nitrogen. Right? Those two are in the air. And then there's a little bit of uh, argon. And then plus other minor components, which really don't matter because they're so small. So these are the main components. Okay. So what's the pressure of oxygen versus nitrogen versus argon? Well, you need to know how much of each one there is, right? Because the pressure is related to the moles. Right? PV equals M2. That's constant. So as the number of moles goes up, the pressure goes up. So if we know the number of moles, we know the ratio of the two. So how much nitrogen in there? Well, about 79%. How much oxygen? About 20%. And the argon is about 1%. Okay. So this atmosphere is due to a pressure of oxygen of 0 0.2 atmospheres and a pressure of nitrogen of 0 0.79 atmospheres and a pressure of argon at 0 0.01 atmospheres. Add those all up, you get one atmosphere. Okay. That's a practical example of Dalton's law of partial pressures. So what we're saying here is, if we have 1.75 moles of helium against 8.4 atmospheres, uh, that's the same as 1.75 moles of any gases. In this case, a mixture of neon, helium, and hydrogen. Gives you the same pressure. Or this mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon gives you uh, that same pressure because it's the same number of moles of each one. So it doesn't matter what the gases are in there, whether it's pure gas or a mixture. It only depends on how many moles total. And the partial part is here. What's the partial part? There, 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 there. Okay. The reason you can say that is because compared to the distance between molecules of gas, their sizes are point source. They have no, virtually have no volume at all. So the particles don't contribute to the volume of the gas. It's just the space between. That's why when you put two gases together, you always get a solution. They're so far apart. There's room for everybody. Mix them together. They always go perfectly into, into that mixture as a solution. Homogeneous mixture every time. OK. Let's see, I want to be sure that I cover all our topics, and I'm going to have to skip this one. This is a practical application of Dalton's partial pressure. Um, when you uh, decompose potassium chloride, you get potassium chloride here and oxygen gas here. So we want to find out how much is produced by that. You collect the gas in here, but what is it? It's a combination of oxygen and water vapor. Right. So what you got to do is figure out what pressure is due to the water vapor and subtract that out. <coughs> then the rest of it is oxygen. And fortunately, water is not very volatile. And we have charts that tell you what's the pressure of oxygen at this temperature. Right. 
So we just need to know your temperature, then you can find out where the pressure is and subtract it. And then the rest of it is oxygen. Then you can do your stoichiometry between this much potassium chlorate and that much oxygen, and what's left over is potassium chloride. Okay, um, there's our chart. So this is the pressure of, of water vapor at these various temperatures, right? So to find oxygen, we subtract the water vapor pressure from the total, and Bob's your uncle. Okay, so that's Dalton's law of partial pressures. So, I'm going to run out of time if I, if I spend time on this one. So, we'll do that one. Um, there's one just like it in your homework, in the review document. So, we'll cover that one uh, next Tuesday. See if it makes sense to you first. <coughs> Okay, here's another one. If we have time, I'll come back to them. Um, right, I need to get to the kinetic molecular theory. Up to this point, we've talked about laws. Remember what a law is. It just says, this is what happens. If you know these conditions, then it'll happen this way every time. We don't know why. So the law doesn't explain why. The theory presents a model that helps you understand why. And that's what we are proposing with the kinetic molecular theory of gases, explaining why gases behave the way they do. And if we understand the kinetic molecular theory of gases, it also helps us understand in, a kin in kinetic terms what happens in liquids and solids as well. It just takes a little tweaking of the theory and you can apply it to any form of matter. Okay, so we have certain postulates, things that we assume at the beginning. Gases consist of tiny particles, atoms and molecules. Right, right, we already knew that. These particles are very small compared to their total volume. Right? So they really have no influence on the volume. The distance between them is so huge, in other words. The, the particles are in constant motion always moving. In fact, at this temperature, um, nitrogen molecules are moving at the speed of sound. But their motion is random, backwards and forth. So you don't get a pressure wave at the speed of sound, right? Because they're all, they cancel each other out. They just move in all different directions. But individual molecules are moving really fast. We also have to assume that the particles are not interacting with one another significantly. In other words, when they come close, they don't attract, they don't repel. They just act like billiard balls. Like when they smack into each other, they do just like playing pool. They just hit and bounce off. No interaction. The kinetic energy of the particles in your gas average kinetic energy. Remember, we can calculate kinetic energy as one half mass times volume squared, uh, velocity squared. You can calculate the kinetic energy of an individual particle, whether it's a bowling ball 
or a marble or a molecule. Individuals have this much kinetic energy. But these, this collection of gas molecules have a lot of different kinetic energies for each one. But on average, all taken together, their kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. So the temperature is a measure of their kinetic energy. The higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy they have. Okay. So there's your formula. Now, how do we explain gas pressure? Well, remember what pressure is. Pressure is the force per unit area. So when does a molecule apply force that we can measure? When it smacks into the walls of the container, right? When it hits the wall of the container, we can measure a force. All we have to do is have a gauge there that will respond to that strike, right? So that measures the pressure by measuring the force of that impact. But one impact's got, not going to be enough to measure. <laughs> you have to have millions and millions of impacts per second to get a measurable pressure on our gauge. So let's take it one step further. If you have a million impacts per second, then you get this pressure. What if you cram more molecules in there, and now you have 2 million impacts per second? on that. What's the pressure going to do? Well, that's the kinetic molecular theory. The pressure responds to the number of impacts because these molecules are in constant motion and the more of them you have smacking the walls of your container, the higher the pressure. That's why when you shove more of them in there, you get a higher pressure. Or if you hold the pressure constant and you shove more of them in there, they're gonna push on the container until you reach a balance point again. Okay, we have four minutes left. I'm talking about balloons. We'll have to leave that till our review. <clears throat> so what happens if you have helium and hydrogen in the balloon? This is another consequence of Avogadro's law. Avogadro said that if you have two volumes that are exactly equal, and the temperatures between the two are equal, and the, the volume, temperature, and the pressure in each one is equal. Then we know, based upon our combined gas law, if those are all equal, then the number of moles also has to be equal. So Avogadro said that, and it doesn't matter what the gas is. All right, so we've got these two balloons, same volume. So, oops, <laughs> the pressures of the gas in the two balloons are the same volume, that means, and we haven't changed anything else, they're the same volume, then they have to have the same number of moles in them, which means they exert the same pressure. Okay, they're at equilibrium with the atmospheric pressure and the force 
applied to them by the elastic balloon. Now, why do they exert the same pressure? Well, um, helium is a, is a bigger atom than the dihydrogen molecule, right? It's twice as, as heavy, right? H2 is 2.02 grams per mole, and helium is four grams per mole. But they're at the same temperature. So we know they have the same average kinetic energy. That means when they strike the walls of the container, they're gonna apply the same pressure because they have the same energy. Now, in order to get that energy, these hydrogen molecules have to be traveling faster, right? Because kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. If the, and remember that's uh, m, oops, squared. So as this one goes up, that one has to go down. Or this one goes down, that one goes up. So if we decrease the mass, velocity has to go up by the square in order to have the same energy. But that doesn't matter because at that temperature, those things are going to happen automatically to give you the same kinetic energy. Okay, so the temperature of the gas in the two balloons is what? It's the same. They have the same kinetic energy, the same pressure, same moles. Temperature has to be constant. Okay, what about this one? The number of moles of the gas, well, we already said that. <laughs> it's the same. And then there's your explanation. Let's see. How about the densities of the gas in the two balloons? That's a different animal, right? Because you've got the same number of moles, same number of particles of gas, but one's lighter than the other. Hydrogen weighs less than helium, right? So it's gonna have half mass for the same volume. So the density, remember, is equal to uh, mass per unit volume. So if the mass of the molecule goes down and the volume is constant, then let's put the volume over here, like that. That puts our constant on the left-hand side, right? The volume is constant. So now we know that this is a direct proportion because it's a quotient. So if the mass goes down, that means indirect, excuse me. That one is direct. The mass goes up, density goes up. So the mass goes down, say from helium to hydrogen, the density has to go down also. So they're different. That's why the uh, Hindenburg on the various Zeppelins, they could actually carry more mass than a helium filled balloon. It was just hazardous. But the efficiency of the balloon was much higher they could carry less hydrogen and get the same performance as a balloon with helium in it. You just couldn't have the sparks. Okay. Uh, so this is just concept check. You know, this is pressure volume, remember hyperbola. There we go. Volume temperature is a direct proportion. Um, we should get volume in moles, direct proportion. Pressure moles is also direct proportion. Um, all right, so I'm gonna have to skip that. We're out of time, right, 940. So what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll cover these concepts in a review. And there actually, there should be um, an earlier recording of this lecture from last spring. If you want to actually see, I think I had time last spring 
to actually do these problems at the end. So you could skip to the end and see this stuff you know, on, the, on an earlier version. But we'll hammer that one hard, especially the uh, uh, stoichiometry. Okay. All right. That's it for today. I see Brianna's name there, but I didn't hear from her at all. <laughs>